What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I am Guru951. Join us as we go on a quest to solve the world's oldest video game mystery in the world's oldest space simulator. This is the quest for Raxla. It's my opinion that the most important thing to do in an investigation is to get to the source of your problem, your crime, your missing person, your robbery, whatever it might be that you're investigating, your source is likely to hold the strongest and most consistent clues and connections. Now for us, that's going to come from a YouTuber named J. Patrick Smith, which goes by the name Commander Finn McMillan. A revelation on his end that took place on April 28th, 2016. And that's the book, The Alien World, The Complete Illustrated Guide, written by Steven Eisler, which we found out was an alias for Robert Holdstock the original author of the Dark Wheel novella that accompanied your purchase of Elite in 1984. The mysterious thing here is that The Alien World was released in 1982, so two years prior to Elite. And it's the only book we know of that has an entire chapter on what and where Raxel is, and it gives us a pretty good understanding of what the Dark Wheel is. Now, it needs to be said first and foremost that The Alien World tells a story of a world that is absolutely outside of the norm in comparison to the elite galaxy. The elite galaxy is humans and the story of our expansion off of Earth onto other planets within our own solar system and then of course interstellar travel to other neighboring star systems. And of course the story of us gaining the capability to travel beyond our own solar system well off to the opposite side of the galaxy if we want. And we have two what appear to be alien type of races. The Guardians, which are supposedly extinct, having been killed off by their own artificial intelligence, which is now about one to two million years old, and somehow nobody's talking about that, and the Thargoids. But the alien world tells of a much broader range of life in a much, much larger universe. And so by no means is this considered canon or official. But then again, there's also no rule book on how you can go about solving this riddle. The first chapter is the Oasir Raxla Sector, that part of the known universe that lies on the human side of the Night Wall. The immense barrier of time and space distortion that has resulted from the passage of a subspace galaxy is called the Oasir Raxla Sector. After the dominant race, this biozone comprises less than 2,000 galaxies, clustered tightly almost into a circle, bordered by the Therana Void and the Delvan Void, where there is instability in the fabric of space itself. It is separated from the human sector by the Ergonurk Darks, a straggling line of vast black holes lined up along 40 million ions, drawing dense strands of dark gas from the night wall. This has meant that human contact with the Oasir Raxla has been minimal, despite the proximity of the sectors, and no human colonies have been established within the region. We're told that the Oasir Raxla are gigantiform exoskeletal reptiloid analogs. Make of that what you will. They're warlike and they have a highly advanced technology, and they have a pretty overwhelming desire for conquest, which is really about two things, slavery being one of those, and the other we're going to be touching on in just a second. It says they arose in a globular cluster called the Saramandara Pearls, and that their planet of origin is Zoth, which means home, and it's on a 1,000 year orbit. The vast majority of that time the planet is barren, but when the orbit hits the right spot, life flourishes. The Oasir Raxla adapted to this the fastest and therefore became the dominant species. They flew ships that were hollowed out boulders that had fallen from mountains and volcanoes. They also had the ability to transmit their minds into machines and robots. They can literally become these things, and they used this in their conquests. Anything with the circuit board, hearing aids, luxury liners, personal computers, public transport, they would become the machines and then turn on their owners. And because they weren't seen, this ended up leading to a lot of myths, especially within the religious societies. Their true reason for conquest was to build something called the Talmor Lens, which was a tool they used to enslave time and space itself, to give them the ability to travel anywhere at any time. The universe was at their grasp as long as they would build these lenses. Now these consisted of lenses, stabilizers, harnesses, and structures, which they would use to focus everything on the Saramandara pearls, which we spoke of earlier as their origin. Now we find out that they sent task ships, which are very much like generation ships, and these task ships were set to build these Talmor lenses further and further and further on their travels. A million lenses, a million stabilizers, a million harnesses, and a million structures. 
Now, one of these ships ended up finding Earth, and then it found Egypt, which already had a ready-made society. And so what they did is they built robots in the image of men, and they sent them down to contact the locals. And the Egyptians named them Horus, most recognizable as the god with the falcon head. Now, it took about four generations, but the Oasir finally convinced the pharaohs to build their tombs as pyramids. The problem being is that the task ships had been out so long that they had lost a lot of the knowledge as well as their main goal. And not only that, but Earth lacked the materials. And so what they did is they built the pyramids out of stone. And they ended up building them wrong as a result by pointing them at the stars. Yet nothing is really told of what the result is of pointing them at the stars, other than that it put the quest of the Talmor lens and their dream of controlling time and space to an end. This here is really intriguing if you ask me because it ties directly to the Orion correlation theory. And if you're unfamiliar with that theory, it was originally brought to light from the Egyptologist Eric von Daniken. And it states that the Great Pyramids of Egypt, and now we find other pyramids around the world, align with mathematical precision with Orion's belt. For unknown reasons, of course. But for us, this could have very strong implications. All we need to do is take a look at Barnard's Loop. Not a lot of people are aware of this. After all, Barnard's Loop is not visible with the naked eye. But the most mysterious thing, and it's something I learned strictly from playing this game, is that Barnard's Loop sits smack in the middle of Orion's belt. And intriguingly, it's permit lock. Now, if you don't know what a permit lock is, there are star systems, there are entire sectors, which can be hundreds if not hundreds of thousands of stars, and there are four lone planets that all have a permit lock, which means we cannot visit them. Some of the permits that exist within the elite galaxy, we can attain. If you do enough rank for the Federation, you can get access to some of their permit locked systems. If you do work for the Empire, you'll get access to their systems. And if you work for the Alliance, you can get access to their one permit locked system. But the vast majority of these permit locks, we have zero idea of how to attain them. And that's not based on a lack of effort on the community's part. Polaris, our North Star, and the tip of the handle on the Little Dipper, probably the best example of a star system that's permit locked. In the game Frontier First Encounters, which was the game just previous to Elite Dangerous, this permit was actually obtainable. Now back to Barnard's Loop. The nebula itself is multiple nebulas. We have the Flame Nebula, the Orion Nebula, the Running Man Nebula, and Horsehead Nebula. And Witchhead Nebula is also close by. It's a literal star factory. Now let's go back to Orion's Belt. The star on the left is a beautiful class O named Alnatok, and it sits about 1260 light years from Earth. The star on the right is also a gorgeous class O, but within Elite, there's also a black hole within the system, and it sits about 1200 light years from Earth. Both of these systems have Taurus beacons in them, yet neither of those Taurus beacons inform you that you're in the Orion's belt. It's almost as if they just don't want you to know that. The star in the center is the furthest star from Sol, at about 2000 light years, and its name is Alnalam, although within Elite, its name is Epsilon Orionis. It's a massive Class B star, and it also has a black hole in it. Now we're going to cover Chapter 4 within the alien world. This is called the Narati Inu Sector. Within that area of space, there were two races. The Narathnu, they were tall and slender and had copper skin. They were dancers and musicians and storytellers, really. And they would exchange grand performances for food and air that would get them along on their journeys. And then you had the Narati Inu, which was deemed the lesser Narathnu. They had olive skin, they were squat, and generally just looked down upon. They were traders of anything, anytime, anywhere. Mostly metals and material goods, but they would also trade specimens of other life forms that ultimately would be put in zoos. The Narathnu performers would tell stories called the Tells from the Dark Wheel, which was a galaxy shrouded in dust and gas. One of the stories they told was about the Great Ship, which was a human ship that somehow traveled through a rift in space and time and ended up in the Narati Inu sector. And their homeworld was Earth, although spelled U-U-R-T-H. And the story goes that this happened while humans were still in the Stone Age. And it's also said that when the humans traveled through that rift in space-time, their minds became plagued with paranoia and distrust for other intelligent life. And this ends up resulting not knowing much about the humans within that sector, uh, because everything's pretty much scared of them. There were stories about heroes and heroines and treasure hunts small but vicious bands of outcasts who lived in the forest who would cause great rebellions. And they still wore medieval garb, 
and they still carried swords. Now, if you were a fellow commander and a fellow Raxla hunter, you were definitely familiar with that mysterious group, the Dark Wheel, and their description as not only investigators, but also as treasure hunters. It's all very intriguing if you ask me. I hope everybody enjoyed this video and discussion today. And just remember folks, your ship has a vast library of information, and it's called the Codex. And as a Raxel Hunter, it's in your best interest to scour this thing thoroughly for clues. Surely they are more than meets the eye, and it's up to all of us to figure that out. I think it would only be natural in the next video that we cover the Dark Wheel novella, and I look forward to presenting that. So with that being said, y'all stay tuned, fly safe. I look forward to seeing you next time.